Quick reminder before we begin that I have a Patreon. My patrons are absolutely amazing people. I have five different tiers that you can join and each tier has different rewards and different perks. But right from the $1 tier, the one thing that everyone has access to is a Discord server where I and everyone else in my Patreon talks about books all the time. So come join if you're interested. Now let's talk about fantasy. Here are three great modern fantasy books for you to check out. All three of the books I'm going to talk about here are the first book in a series or trilogy, which means there's a lot to enjoy here. If you're into it, you might be in it for the long haul. Each of these three books has something at least slightly unique to add to the ever-expanding and diversifying world of modern fantasy literature. Let's go. I'm going to talk about these in the order in which I read them, which means starting with probably the most curious one. This is Wolf Song by TJ Klune. It is the first in a four-part series of fantasy books. TJ Klune is a massive name in fantasy. His standalone fantasy novel, The House in the Cerulean Sea, took the world by storm. It became such a huge hit in the fantasy realm, and since then his name has just gotten bigger in the fantasy genre. And my sales pitch for Wolf Song is pretty simple. What if Twilight was actually good and also gay? <laughs> That's kind of what Wolf Song is. This novel is set in a small rural community in Oregon. We're in the modern day, and so this is kind of urban fantasy, despite the setting very much not being urban. Our protagonist is a young boy, and we watch him grow through his teenage years. His name is Ox, which is short for Oxnard, and the only Oxnard I can think of is a town in California that I haven't been to. The book begins on a really, really somber note. Ox is standing by his door, watching his dad leave. His dad says to him, sorry kid, gotta go. Mum's not home, and when she does come home, dad's gone. And Ox just has to say goodbye to his dad. At this point, he's like 11, 12 years old, and now it's just him and his mum. Luckily, this is a pretty tight-knit community, and a very, very small one. And there's this really, really lovely, heavily tattooed, sweet guy who runs the local garage, and he looks after Ox, he looks out for him, he's a decent father figure to Ox, and he plays into the story more than you would expect. When Ox is 16, a family move in to a house that is on their street, which is more of a dirt path, and that house has been abandoned for a long time, and now this family live there. They're called the Bennett family. There's a mother, a father, the father's brother, and three sons and I cannot tell you why TJ Klune decided to name the mother Elizabeth Bennett. <laughs> like, he named one of the characters in this after one of the most famous protagonists in the history of literature. No idea what's going on there. Her name's Elizabeth Bennett, and when Ox is 16, the youngest son of the Bennett family, Joe, takes an immediate liking to him. And at this point, Joe is only 10 years old. And he starts talking to Ox. He immediately really likes Ox and he wants to be his best friend and spend all of his time with him. We find out not long after that Joe had actually been mute for quite a while. Something awful happened to him. Joe was kidnapped. He was taken away by someone and kept out of the family's reach until they managed to rescue him. And since then, he's been mute. But as soon as he meets Ox, he starts talking. The liking that he takes to Ox is almost instinctive. He sees him, he smells him, and he goes, yeah, this is a good guy. This is someone I want to be friends with, someone who I will talk to. And then, very, very quickly, and this is given away in the blurb, so it's not a spoiler, Ox finds out this is a family of werewolves. These people all shapeshift into wolves. And this connection that Ox and Joe share is instinctive. It is bestial. Ox continues to grow up. By the time he turns, I think, 22 or 23, Joe turns 16. During these few years, we've watched them all grow up. We've watched the family get really, really close to Ox and his mother. Ox has learned their secret. He's seen them shapeshift. And he starts calling himself a member of their pack, even though he cannot transform himself. But he can if he takes the bite. They are happy to bite him and turn him into a wolf, but he is just not sure if he wants that, and that friction inside his mind continues all the way through the book. Now, eventually, without giving too much away, villains are introduced and tragedy starts following these people. Ox and the Bennett family have to deal with tragedy, some unexpected friction, some pain, some loss, and there are villains to fight. 
and Joe, even though he's the youngest son, is destined to be the alpha of the pack. Once he turns about 17, and Ox is now about 23, their romance can finally start. Joe has wanted Ox since he was 10, and he's waited until he matured for them to finally be together. Ox has dated a few different people, he tried dating a girl for a while, but eventually he realizes he's either gay or bisexual, I can't remember, and he and Joe, their romance begins. So this is very much an urban fantasy romance story. I would actually say that the queer romance between the two is the most important and front and center aspect to this story. So you can probably see now why I call this Twilight but gay and good. An outsider joins a pack of werewolves, falls in love with the one who's destined to be the alpha, and there is an outsider group that act as their villains. It's Twilight but gay and good. But I should say just quickly that I can imagine people taking issue with the age gap between Ox and Joe. I've seen this a little bit on Goodreads reviews. I felt it myself as I read it. In fact, I thought it really early on. I was like, hang on, are these two gonna be a couple? Because right now, as I'm reading it, this kid's 10. TJ Klune invites controversy with his choices in his writing, and here's another one. And then you kind of go, it's fiction. It's not trying to teach us morals. I, I feel kind of conflicted about it. Do I just let it be as a piece of fiction? Or do I admit that this is problematic and strange and people have a right to be concerned and feel uncomfortable? Yeah, it's complicated. I think I'm just gonna let you and your morals dictate what you do with that. I certainly felt a little bit icky when I read it, while also feeling the urge to push that aside for the sake of a good story and interesting and diverse characters. It's complex. I'll leave that one to you. But this is a really fun evolution of the fantasy, where you've got urban fantasy, you've got an intense amount of romance, you've got beautiful queer characters and queer stories. It's a reason to celebrate the evolution of fantasy into something far more queer and diverse and blended with the genre of romance. A lot of fantasy has romantic elements, but this is romance. And I think that's cool. Next is The Bone Ships by R.J. Barker, the first book in a trilogy. And I'm just realizing now as I talk about it that all three of these books have authors who use their initials. T.J. Klune, R.J. Barker, and then I'm gonna talk about C.L. Clarke. Nothing to say about that, just noticed it. I also just wanna bring up an obvious aesthetic comparison to the works of Robin Hobb. As soon as I saw this, I was like, oh, this is some Robin Hobb ripoff. But then I realized that that was the publisher's choice, not the author's. This is nothing to do with Robin Hobb. In fact, you might be able to see here that she liked it, she critiqued it positively. And I love the works of Robin Hobb, she's my favorite fantasy author. But the color scheme, the font, the design, this cover is very Robin Hobb. And I thought this was gonna be some live ship traders ripoff, but it really, really isn't. It was just a sort of tactical aesthetic choice made by the publisher, I guess. Anyway, I love ships, I love nautical stuff, I love pirates, so I was all in on this. The Bone Ships is set in a world of archipelagos, an entire world of just small islands scattered everywhere, and these archipelagos have kind of been divided in half. And these two nations, made up of separate archipelagos, are at war, and they have been at war forever, for so long that war has become tradition for them. They no longer remember why they do it, it's basically just a war of retaliation. Each side predictably does a thing, and the other side responds in kind, and so there is a consistent and constant cycle. It just doesn't stop. It is also a war of attrition, because there is a lack of natural resources to build the ships that they need to go to war with. So, all the ships in this world are made out of bones, hence the bone ships, and they are the bones of sea dragons, which is really gnarly and really cool. But the problem is, sea dragons haven't been seen in generations. People assume that they must have gone extinct, which means they have no materials left to build new ships. That's why it's a war of attrition. Eventually it has to stop. Eventually a side has to run out of ships, run out of resources. But, as the blurb says, a dragon has been found. Someone spied a sea dragon. Whichever side gets that dragon will get new materials to build new warships, and they will then have the upper hand in this war. Our protagonist is, at first, a bit of a loser. He's been made captain of a black ship. There are black ships and white ships. White ships are noble naval vessels. Black ships are crewed by 
criminals who have been condemned to die. They take on miserable, deadly missions. They're basically the Suicide Squad. Our protagonist killed someone very, very important, and so he's been made the shipwife of a ship. All captains are called shipwives. And in the book's opening chapter, a woman challenges him to a duel for the role of shipwife. And she wins, and we find out that she's a legend. Her father is leader of their entire nation, and she was his firstborn. And it is tradition in this world for the firstborn to actually be sacrificed, and for their spirit to power the magic of these ships. <laughs> it's pretty wild. And this is also a matriarchal society. And for a male fantasy author to create a matriarchal society that's really, really dynamic and interesting, oh, I loved it. RJ Barker did such a good job creating a really interesting and compelling matriarchal system. The Bone Ships is a lot of fun. It's really, really well written and it's a very well realized world. There's a lot of lore, a lot of world building, a lot of things that you're gonna have to try to keep up with as you read. So many terms and phrases, myths and legends and traditions and all the stuff that comes with the world building of fantasy, but it's really well executed. And as I said, the matriarchal system and the fact that it's a very on the nose metaphor for climate change and the self-destructive cycles of humanity, it's all really good. It's very obvious that the lack of resources and the endless pointless war, it's all very allegorical of the political and economic behaviors of real life humans in modern day society. That's all very obvious in a very kind of Studio Ghibli way, but I loved it. It's very well executed. Then we have my favorite of the three, The Unbroken by C.L. Clark. This is the first in the Magic of the Lost series, and this is a book that is very, very much about colonialism. This is a fantasy novel that wears its themes and its ideas and its allegories very much on its sleeve. And that turns out to be a really good thing. In The Unbroken, there is an empire. The empire of Baladair has slowly been conquering nearby nations. It struggles with friction against one nation while having pretty easily conquered another. And our protagonist was stolen by the empire as a child. She came from a nation that was annexed by the empire. And she was taken away from her family when she was very, very small. She was taken to Baladair and she was raised as a soldier. Her name is Torain. That's not the name she was born with, but it's the name the Empire gives her. She's been raised as a soldier, now she's in her early 20s, and she's been made lieutenant. And when the novel begins, she's sent back to her original homeland of Kazal. She and a number of other conscripted soldiers have all been sent there to try and quell an uprising, a rebellion. The local people of Kazal are slowly building up momentum as a rebellion forms against the Empire. And even though Kazal is her original home, she has very much been raised and therefore indoctrinated by the Empire. She believes her loyalties are to the Empire. She serves it. She loves it. She's proud of her role as a lieutenant in their army. And our other protagonist is the princess of Baladair who has gone with her to deal with this rebellion. Very early in the book, Torain actually manages to save the princess's life and foil an assassination attempt. And that puts her in the princess's good books. And when it's Torain's job to pull the lever at the gallows and hang a few of the rebels' leaders, one of them, just before she pulls the lever, notices that she looks familiar. She looks like a woman he knows. And he says, hey, you're this woman's daughter, aren't you? Suddenly Torain learns that her mother is alive. We learn her birth name, we learn her mother's name, and this is the spark that begins her questioning her loyalties, her temptation towards the rebellion, towards her original homeland, her people. The temptation to try and wash away the indoctrination. I won't tell you any more because this book goes to some really, really amazing places, but another thing worth mentioning is this is also a queer book. Torain is a lesbian and the princess is probably bisexual. And as the two of them grow closer, we know that a romance can't happen between them. To say there's a political conflict of interest would be an understatement and kind of an insult to the concept of colonialism and rebellion. But there is certainly a tension between them. And I really like the fact that our two protagonists happen to be queer people without the need for there to be some beautiful romance. But that's enough. 
I really don't want to spoil anything. And when it comes to this book's inspirations, it's pretty obvious that this is specifically inspired by the French colonial empire, because all the names sound vaguely French. And there's even a moment early on where a character actually says bonjour to another one. It might happen a few times, but I remember the first time I noticed it. And the nation of Khazal that they have annexed is pretty likely inspired by the nations of North Africa. So it was definitely the French colonial empire specifically that inspired the language, the setting, the culture of this book. And I think that's really cool. There you go. Three books that all begin a series of really, really good fantasy stuff. These are all modern books, and they all do something to separate themselves from the bulk of fantasy. They're queer, they're matriarchal, they have bold new settings that we haven't seen before, and diverse characters. One of them is urban fantasy, the other two are more traditional fantasy, kind of in an epic way. I hope you like them. Check them out. If I had to recommend one, I'd probably recommend The Unbroken. I think that's the smartest one. It's up to you. Go read them. Support me on Patreon if you'd like, and subscribe for books.